Hey, we're going live. All right, finally. All right, we are now live streaming on YouTube. <laughs> Phil Gephardt and Melissa Iarachi. Um, we today want to talk about maximizing your energy. Okay, let me close this out. Maximizing energy production um, with Melissa Iarachi. And after that technical delay, <laughs> um, I'm going to come back to... I want to introduce Melissa and Melissa, I am now not finding your, oh, here we go. Great. I want to introduce Melissa. Um, so she has been a part of the health and fitness industry for over 10 years, uh, beginning her career as a paramedic, which I did not know that, which is quite cool, uh, in Ontario, Canada. Uh, after years of caring for patients affected with chronic disease due to poor nutrition and lifestyle choices, she shifted her focus to preventative health care. Melissa is a sports nutritionist and has expanded her knowledge base, learning from Charles Poliquin and leaders in functional medicine. Currently, Melissa works with strength and conditioning coaches around the world, providing continuing education, protocols, and support. She is the, the sports nutrition specialist with Designs for Sport, owns a successful private practice, and is an instructor at the Canadian School of Natural Nutrition. And if I may add something, because I totally stalked and trolled your Instagram page yesterday for, for content and info, uh, Melissa has a 300-pound deadlift under her belt which is pretty freaking cool. Yeah. Melissa, welcome. Thanks for uh, having this conversation with me today. Thanks, Bill. I, yeah, I drive fast cars and I lift heavy things. That's kind of, <laughs> that's kind of, those are my two skill sets. Um, you know, so that's about it. Okay. Driving fast cars. I like that. Um, uh, what's the fastest car you've ever driven? I'm curious. Oh no, it was just an ambulance light since I, oh. I wish. <laughs> Yeah, I love seeing those. I mean, my girls too. I'm driving all around with my my little two and a half year old and one and a half year old. And man, when they hear the sirens, they're looking around. They love to see the fire trucks and the ambulances. They think it's wonderful. Oh yeah, I still miss that about the job. I know I'm making a better impact being on this side of the healthcare system. But yeah. you know what? What kid doesn't grow up listening to the lights and sirens and thinking that they can drive the car? <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. Um, man, yeah. How cool. Why don't we just can we just talk? Let's start about that. Like, and I know this wasn't the concept, but we'll, I, I just want to have a conversation with you. Um, you know, with the, the healthcare industry, you know, people call it, you know, sick care sometimes, you know, negatively, but um, how do we help more people? And I know you've made that decision for yourself, like this was a better move for you. Uh, but, but how do we just help more people understand that they're, you know, to get to the root cause of the problem versus just taking this magic pill or, you know, like, like my, one of my favorite quotes, um, I can't remember if I heard it somewhere or maybe it conjured up in my brain somehow, but people don't realize how great they're supposed to feel. You know, they go around and they're just, you know, you know, at, at 1030, I need more coffee at 230. I get lethargic. I should have some sugar. I'm going to bed late. Like people don't realize they should be going through life with just a lot of energy, you know, and, and just, you know, crushing life. And that's one reason I wanted to talk about energy production today, not just from a basketball standpoint, but just from a, a human standpoint, like, gosh, people should be going around feeling good and they don't like, how do we help them fix that? It, it, you touch on something really important. And it's funny when I was in school becoming a paramedic, there were certain chronic disease processes that were explained to me as what we called idiopathic. And um, if you're not familiar with the term, it's really just unknown cause. And we, we were told things like high blood pressure was an, there was an unknown cause that all of a sudden, just one day you woke up and you had high blood pressure. Yeah. And I believe that to be true. Um, so, you know, obviously going through that and thinking there's gotta be something wrong combination of my own health journey. Um, and I'm so happy we're talking about energy. I, uh, I had a pituitary tumor undiagnosed for multiple years. So wow. when you talk about cortisol and energy, um, hundred percent, I was that person that felt that just drinking coffee all day long and not sleeping and being tired was, was normal. I attributed it to the fact that I worked shift work and I was training in the gym hard. And I just thought, well, you know, this is just my life. I'm tired all the time. Yeah. Um, come to find out that there's so much of a, a world out there and a better way to look at energy production and support energy production. So I'm happy we're having this conversation. Yeah, 
Yeah. So we're going to cover, I mean, food, we're going to talk about supplementation. We're going to talk about sleep. You covered cortisol. We're going to talk about stress. Um, let's just get right into it. And I thought starting off the conversation, um, and again, I like to talk to people and, and we can go deep on some of these topics, but I really just want to explain the basics to them. Mm -hmm. um, because from my experience coaching athletes, um, even at the professional level, they don't really know. There's a lot of misinformation out there. And especially yeah. nowadays with Instagram, and, and I don't claim to be, you know, the monopoly of truth. But you know, you mentioned the name Charles Poliquin, you mentioned functional medicine. These are, you know, and, and he and that, you know, line of thinking is, I think we can agree is a better way to look at energy, to look at life, to look at, you know, how to help the human body move. So how exactly does energy, you know, happen in the body? You know, where does energy come from? I thought we could, you could just kind of touch about mitochondria maybe, and, and let's just start right there. Yeah. I, I mean, I love the fact that we, we know from more of a physics standpoint, energy isn't created or destroyed. So we, we have this energy unit, this energy uh, system, ATP in the body. And obviously, you know, if we're talking about athletes, depending on the sport, we're going to use different energy systems. I mean, I know you had a great talk uh, with Sean, coach Sean, just talking about, you know, energy systems and yeah. how those are sort of divided when you're looking at a basketball player, predominantly using that creatine phosphorus phosphate or you know glycolytic system but yeah. uh, we have multiple energy systems that we can work in if we're looking at from a basic unit um we're at the cellular level we're talking about mitochondria and these are these kind of like prehistoric bacteria really that we evolved from um yeah. and they're mainly concentrated um well we we have them kind of all over actually except for our red blood cells which is kind of interesting we have mitochondria everywhere um but you know a lot in our eyes a lot in our heart our muscle and um, and these little you know powerhouse of the cell, if you want to call them that, from grade nine science, yeah. they're what give us energy. Um, you know, they they help to produce energy. And now, wh where and I know we're going to get into this, where we can go really wrong is that a lot of what we do in our day to day, uh, a lot of our lifestyle factors could potentially damage uh, the mitochondria that we have. But there's also a lot that we can do to help us number one get rid of the mitochondria that are not opt optimally working um yeah. and support the ones that we have to to work more efficiently do you follow jack cruz at all dr jack cruz i don't okay um he talks a lot about you know we're the first solar powered machines and mitochondria and how they need you know we need sunlight and yeah. um do, do you look at that at all have you studied that at all and can you speak to that a little bit because um, you know, at my gym back in Austin, the, our six pillars are sleep, sunlight, and stress management, nutrition, hydration, and movement. And, and I think people really overlook the sunlight aspect. We're under, you know, fake lights all the time, you know, every day, all day. And then we stay up looking at our screens until we, you know, put our head down on the pillow. And even then after we put our head down on the pillow. And so the, you know, we can talk about the super chiasmatic nucleus if you want, and, you know, the different, you know, the clock in the brain, but how does sunlight affect mitochondria and how does sunlight affect our energy? Let's just, you know, start going through some of these basics. Yeah. I'm with you when it comes to the basics and I'm a really big fan of actionables because especially yeah. as an athlete, if you're listening to this and you're trying to understand some of these more advanced processes at the end of the day, it's what's going to move the needle. So what's the action yeah. that we can do here? So um, we, we run on, actually multiple clocks but if we talk about our circadian rhythm you know the human body was really meant to rise and fall with the sun um it's as basic as that so you know we should actually be getting up with sunlight um and we should be starting to settle down when the sun sets now with the invention of the incandescent bulb we had obviously all of this world of opportunity that opened up to us where we could be in our homes at night with light but our bodies don't understand that. So, no. you know, it's funny you say that before this talk, I, I had a little bit of a busy day and had to kind of straight out the gates, get started on my computer. And I realized, you know, I was kind of a bit sluggish and I knew that you and I had a talk set. So um, instead of actually making a coffee, which I think most people would probably say, yeah, you know, I'm, I've got to do my, my coffee run or, or have an energy drink. Let's say um, I went outside and, and I got 20 minutes of sunlight and I, I didn't wear my sunglasses. You know, I, I went outside and exposed my skin to sun. Um, the best thing that you can do to support your energy, and I'm talking about sleep here, 
Um, it doesn't actually start at night when you think it starts by, mm -hmm. um, oh, you know, I got to prep for bed and have a night routine. Start your sleep routine in the morning. Get up in the morning and get some good quality sun exposure. Um, not through someone who I know is a, a colleague and friend to both of us. Robert Jacobs is a phenomenal speaker yeah. to this concept but you know we're not talking about going in your car and driving somewhere and getting sunlight With we're your talking arm out the window or on the arm out the window <laughs> yeah yeah the windows and your car are completely blocking that sun are you staring outside in a in sort of like a sunroom i'm i'm canadian you know we don't get much sun <laughs> right you get like two maybe good months out of the year yep. so yeah get out there and get some sun and if you don't have access to good quality natural light you can facilitate this with full spectrum bulbs. Um, you can do things like red light therapy. Yep. If, I mean, I think you can notice on the camera that there's a reflection in my glasses. Um, I, I have blue blocking glasses. So I am okay. prioritizing good quality natural sunlight. And while I'm doing that, I'm also trying to block electronic uh, fake light from the electronics that I'm inevitably exposed to. Yeah. You know, and you mentioned you're Canadian and, and I uh, have a lot of uh, Lithuanian basketball players that I've worked with. Um, there's players even more north and more south. You know, Australia is a really popular basketball country. Um, yeah. But and you know this, I'm just saying it for the audience, uh, you know, the farther away you are from that midline of the, you know, the earth, the equator, the less vitamin D, the less sunlight uh, with that UVB rays that creates the vitamin D you're going to get throughout the year. Like Melissa said, she might get two months out of the year. So um, it's really important to, during these summer months, especially those of you who live far north or far south, to get out and get your vitamin D levels up. Um, you mentioned circadian rhythm, and, and you can talk about that in a minute, maybe how that light, you know, the, the light dark cycles help our, our circadian rhythm. Um, but also with basketball, let's be honest, most basketball players, at least in, in America, are black. And the darker your skin is, mm -hmm. the more sunlight you're going to need to get the amount of vitamin D that someone with a lighter skin uh, shade may have. Okay. So. Um, 20, 30 minutes really is kind of what we're looking for at a minimum, right? In, in terms of someone who might have a skin color, you know, like yours, maybe like mine. And then, um, you know, as your, your skin tone gets darker, you might need to be out in the sun a little bit more, get a little more rays. Um, but um, touch a little bit more on the circadian rhythm. And, and if you can, with the, with the sleep, uh, the, the dark wake, the, the light dark cycles and, and sleep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's a study that I really love, um, and they were looking at sleep disruption. And a lot of us, we, we, we know the pineal gland, which is kind of like in the middle between our eyebrows. Um, and we know that when we're looking, let's say at blue light at, at fake light, you know, at night yeah. from from our tablets, from our cell phones, from the television, we know that, okay, well, that could potentially disrupt our sleep. Well, this study was really fantastic. They were looking at participants who were sleeping and they actually just, um, they shined a pen light at the back of their knee. Okay, so so yep. not in their eyes, you know, nowhere near their face. I think that they, they might have even had sleep masks on, if I recall, and um, that was enough. Looking at EEG, so electroencephalogram, your your brain waves, to show that it was enough to disrupt sleep. Yeah. So, I mean, this study, I think is, first of all, I, I like to geek out on this stuff. I think it's pretty fantastic, but it underscores how sensitive we are to light. And we, yeah. we know that our eyes are, um, but your entire body has these receptors that can pick up light. Uh, so, you know, our mutual mentor, Charles Poliquin would say, um, you need to sleep, create the cave. You need to sleep in that dark, cool, uh, hopefully quiet environment. And yep. I mean, it, it's no surprise we we evolved going back to our cave. So I realize, you know, we've come out of a pandemic, it's 2021, it would be kind of silly to say, well, go and sleep in a cave. But there are so many things that we can do. So like for the athletes or the people on the call that are thinking, well, you know, I need to look at my phone for, for work, let's say, maybe that's your excuse. Maybe that's what you're telling yourself. It's for yeah. work. Well, there are apps on your phone to remove blue light on my yeah. iPhone. I actually turn it completely red. Um, there is a downloadable app on your computer that you can use called Flux, F dot L-U-X. This is a free download. None of these yeah. things cost you any money. And, and these are just small little action steps that you can start right now um, to start to remove some of the, the exposure to you, to the blue light. Yeah. 
And what I know about it, and, and again, people listening might think, oh, it's not a big deal. Um, here's what I know and what I've read, and, and please you know, elaborate or correct me if I'm wrong, but these screens, uh, the laptops that we're looking at are essentially about 6,000 degrees Kelvin, which is about the same light temperature as the noonday sun. So if we're looking at these well into the night, our brain still thinks daytime, create cortisol, don't create melatonin, and then our sleep is disrupted. So, um, you know, M Melissa isn't just kind of throwing these random facts. There's actual mechanisms that, that show, hey, if you look at screens well into the night, your sleep will be disrupted because you're not making melatonin because you're telling your brain it's daytime, we need cortisol because we need to work. Um, and so, it, it, I mean, it's really important. And like, so like you said, darken all the screens. I love the, the, the silly orange glasses and they make, yes. you know, cool, you know, nice looking ones nowadays. I still just use the old UVX ones. And, um, and one thing I like to do, and I like to tell people when talking about this, um, go online uh, and just type in a search bar, uh, blue light blocking glasses test. Um, Cause there's websites that, you know, will will actually, you can test your glasses to make sure they're blocking the blues. Um, and a lot actually don't. So, um, okay. So, we're talking, you know, I think an easy transition is to go into sleep and how and I'm sure everybody can already just think it, but let's talk about the mechanisms of sleep and, and how that affects our energy, how it affects mitochondria, um, how it affects our brain, maybe, and, you know, insulin and all that fun stuff. Like, where would you start that conversation? Yeah, I mean, I, I like to kind of, I'm, I'm a, again, we'll go back to me nerding out here a little bit, but I also like to kind of throw out some stats just to really set the stage on where we're at. The okay. average adult, we, we need about seven to nine hours. Okay, we know that the National Sleep Foundation um, has published that and that's as recent as 2015. Um, now, if you are the, an average youth, especially youth athlete, that actually increases. So you're going to need more. We're looking anywhere between eight to 10 hours at that point. Again, this is published research. Um, this is where it starts to get a little bit interesting. Just two hours of sleep deprivation is enough to impair performance, attention, working memory. So that includes long-term memory and decision-making. Wow. You also see a 10% reduction in uh, pain tolerance. So this is actually where we see the risk of injury go right up. Wow. Um, so when we're talking about sleep, you know, we're not just trying to be, um, you know, let's say nagging parents here or as a coach, like, hey, did you get your sleep? Um, we're looking out for your career um, and your ability to actually perform on the court. So that that's really kind of a, a glimpse into what sleep can actually help with. Specifically for youth athletes, um, a lack of sleep is an independent risk factor for injury. Yeah. Um, and it actually impacts the immune system by increasing your risk of, up, of upper respiratory tract infection. Um, I think with everything that's gone on now, we're very much more concerned with our immune system and supporting that. Um, we had this really cool research that came out in um, 2011 that showed that two to three weeks of sleep extension, and we'll talk about some of the ways to actually do that. Um, and this was specific to sports performance. It increased reaction time. Uh, they also increased swimming speed for, for athletes performing in, in that specific sport, um, agility. Um, and then it also actually increased free throw and three point accuracy. Um, wow. So, so this is a, a really cool, again, you know, why, like for me, when it comes to why, uh, what I'm going to do to improve my sleep, I want to attach a why to it. Um, yeah. So I really want to, to kind of underscore that. Um, like I said, the first step for an athlete looking to improve their sleep in, in my books is to start with that exposure to sunlight in the morning, yeah. um, get good quality, natural sunlight. Not only is that going to help with testosterone production um, and anabolic hormones, but your circadian rhythm is now like, oh, okay it's morning. Um, if the first thing you do is open up your computer, sit under a fluorescent bulb, what we're really telling our brains is that, you know, we're kind of going to be on, <laughs> on autopilot for the rest yeah. of the day. We need to yeah. get that nice jolt of energy. I believe it was Charles that said, you know, women have their cycles and everyone knows that, but men also have their cycles too. And it's that 24 hour cycle and testosterone mm -hmm. ebbs and flows with the daytime and the sunshine. Uh, and, and, you know, again, you're, you're talking about health and, you know, touched on men's health, but, you know, basketball players who are, who are male, it is critical that you get to bed. Um, and I know it's tough, you know, especially being a former basketball player. I mean, some of your games don't end until 9 30, 10, even later. And then, you know, you, you're still have this, you know, emotional, you know, roller coaster going on in your brain. It's tough to wind down. Yeah. You have to get some food, you have to digest it. I mean, you might get to bed at two or three in the morning. And, and a lot of guys that I knew, 
man, especially on the road, they would go out, they would, you know, party all night, sleep in really late and go back and play ball the next day and do it all over again the next night. And it's like, gosh, you guys, if you, I always tell guys, act like a professional, not just on the court, act like a professional when you're out, when you're eating, when you're sleeping, like it's really, really important. Um, and man, that, that sleep is so, so critical. Um, what about stress? And, and I, so, well, let's go back real quick. Cause you mentioned youth athletes and I remember um, varying statistics and, and, you know, I'll probably get them wrong, but it's something, you know, between middle school and high school athletes, 40 to 60% get, don't get enough sleep. Um, and, and if I remember right, the stats were, you know, for that 13 to 15, 16 year old, they need nine to 10 hours. Mm -hmm. And that's if they're not doing any exercise, if they're exactly. not athletes. So what numbers have you seen, you know, especially with the youth athletes, because I, I love working with youth athletes and, um, but, um, you know, so about two, about three years ago, I had a, you know, athlete come in and I'm training her and, and right when she, as she's warming up, dad motions me over and I walk over and he's like, kick her ass. She needs a good workout today. Hmm. I'm like, okay, so what did she have for breakfast? And, you know, I don't remember, but it was something, you know, bowl of cold cereal. What did she have for lunch? You know, I hollered at her across the room. What'd you have for lunch? Oh, I had a, uh, you know, a half a sandwich and a cookie. Mm -hmm. carbs, okay. Carbs, and then you carbs. didn't have anything since then after school and how much sleep did you get last night? I got about seven hours. Like, so when I go to her dad, I'm like, you expect her to have a good workout without the proper fuel and the proper sleep. Um, it, it's ridiculous. So anyway, what, what numbers have you seen in, 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 in terms of sleep deprivation for, for athletes? Yeah, I mean, it definitely goes up for youth. Um, I like to go a little bit higher than like, the, again, the typical eight, and I like to look for at least 10. But yeah. touching on some more specifics, in addition to the quantity of sleep, um, I'm really looking at quality, like you said, totally. um, we go through sleep cycles throughout the night, a sleep cycle varies between 90 to 120 minutes. Um, for a youth athlete, it's also really looking at, you know, what time did you go to bed? And what time did you wake up? Funny enough, a lot of the school system and, and what is like a normal schedule for youth um, is not is not putting them at an advantage based on what's going on in their circadian rhythm. Yeah. It's funny, we yell at our teenagers because they're up late and then they sleep in later in the morning. Well, that's because their circadian rhythm is actually set that way. Yeah. So for, for younger children and to the moms and the dads of these athletes listening, you know, your, your youth athlete might actually go to bed a little bit later at night um, and let them have that time to sleep in. Now, this is a bigger problem because obviously the school system, it's like, well, you to get up and be at school at eight o'clock and then we right. wonder why is my teenage student sitting here underperforming well it's because their brain is still asleep yeah yeah and you said that you know 90 to 120 minute cycles um i've seen athletes need about four maybe even five of those cycles and it's yes. and again so there's those again cycles throughout the night and it's that stage three and stage four, right? That they really get that recovery. That's growth necessary. hormone is released then. Yeah, exactly. So we got to get those the four to five cycles of night parents, uh, athletes, or, or you're just not going to recover properly. And if like, you're waking up groggy, you might have woken up within a sleep cycle. So yeah. this is where we want to, again, go back to like, when did you fall asleep? And when are you waking up? You might want to toggle it back or forth, hopefully back to get a little bit more sleep. Yeah. Um, it might not be that you're not sleeping properly. It might just be that you're, you're waking up in the middle of that sleep cycle. Now, of course, there are nutrients that can help. But before we do anything with a supplementation point, you know, we need to be eliminating the blue light, getting good quality and quantity of sleep. And then if there's still a problem, we can look at something like, let's say a mag three and eight to help with a restless mind. But yeah. um, we have to do the, the, fir the groundwork first. I'm sure you've had these folks too. I had a gal one time, she comes in, um, she, you know, whatever research she was doing online, she found a supplement. Hey, can I get this supplement? Will it help me? I don't remember the problem. And I was like, okay, yeah, it might help. But what time did you go to bed last night? And she, it was like, you know, three o'clock. That was when yeah. Candy Crush was really popular. And she stayed up until <laughs> three in the morning playing Candy Crush. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, well, let's do this. Let's hold off on the supplement and let's have you go to bed at least by midnight. Can you get to bed by midnight tonight? You know what I mean? And try to yeah. work back almost to 10, 1030. But yeah, it's so funny. People just, they want that magic pill. That's how we're kind of uh, trained nowadays. 
And coming from someone who, of course, yes, I work with an education and a supplement company. Yeah. Supplements are a supplement to the foundation that yeah. you're laying. So yes, sure. The supplement is the sexy answer, right? It's right. like, let's take a pill, but we are at, especially for sleep, we are masking a larger problem. So the way that I look at it is if we need to use some magnesium or a sleep support in order to work on the bigger solution, then that's okay. As long as we're getting to the root cause, but you know, sleep issues can happen because because of hormonal imbalances, detoxification issues, it could be environmental issues or stressors. Um, you know, it, it, there's an array of reasons. So let's get to the actual bottom of that root cause uh, reason for the poor sleep. I love that. So we're going to get basketball players into energy systems and, and what energy system and fuel sources you use on the court. But I want to talk real quick since we covered the other basics. Can we talk obviously about nutrition? Nutrition is fuel for our body. Um, how, how do you think uh, and I know we both are big fans of the meat and nut breakfast. Mm -hmm. and, and so what I do typically with my clients is I try to get breakfast dialed in first, like make the, the first meal of the day. Let's focus on one meal at a time. Let, let's start with breakfast. Um, but how would you handle a client that just doesn't have enough energy and you're looking at their food log? And again, it could be anywhere. Um, what do you think? And I know this is a generalized statement, uh, but maybe you can talk about what is a good energy packed you know, food day look like for, for the average person and then for the athlete. For sure. I mean, I think that's a, a great place to start. And I love, um, again, just kind of going back to some of your nutrition talks uh, with coach Sean, I love that you said, you know, building on breakfast, one of the first action items I start on with, whether it's a client or an athlete who's working with me is what we call, you know, building a better breakfast. Cool. Um, so I, I do love, the meat and nut breakfast, but I know that for some people having a big ribeye in the morning, especially if your appetite is low is less than desirable. So, you know, we can work on kind of where you're at and go from there. I think the most important thing to remember is within waking, it doesn't have to be a ribeye, but let's get at least 30 grams of protein in with that, that meal. Now I'm a big fan, similar to you. I usually try to get protein intake based on body uh, size. Um, so, you know, for someone like myself, I'm at least doing a gram and a half of protein per, per pound of my body weight per pound. Um, and that might sound like a lot to you. Um, but believe it or not, it's the best thing that I could have done for my energy levels and my body composition. Yeah. So, and, and this is a big thing, especially for, for female athletes, but male athletes are not immune to this, um, you know, reds and under nourishing and under eating and therefore underperforming. um, athletes require so much more energy calorie right? And they're, they're not getting it. And I, I get it. You know, there's so many other things as an athlete that sh that's on your mind, or even if you're not an athlete, you're a, a busy, I like to call them my corporate athletes, my full-time parents and business owners, the morning might not be a time where you're, you're hungry per se. Right. But let's look at why that's the case. Um, are you starting your day with a cup of coffee, which is an appetite suppressant? Well, you know, maybe starting with water first and getting something um, in food wise could be important. But if the meat and nut breakfast is like over here and you're like, okay, give me something that's like over here. I'm not there yet. Um, I usually, you know, like to use a good quality grass fed beef protein, um, get in some good quality fats in there. So maybe yeah. you're blending it up with some almond butter, some macadamia nut butter, or um, better yet, you're actually having those raw nuts uh, on the side and you're actually chewing, masticating when you're, when you're downing a shake, you don't have the salivary, salivary amylase and those enzymes in your mouth when you start to chew happen. So you're kind of like downing, you know, what, three, four, a thousand calories, depending on your shake, uh, in what five minutes, right? You can't eat a steak that quickly. So in school, we sort of taught, you know, you should be uh, chewing your liquids and drinking your foods. Uh, digestion really starts with how, how well you're chewing. That's cool. I forgot about that. I've heard that years ago. And it's yeah. one of those things. I'm, I'm glad you said that. I'm like, Oh, yeah, I remember that. That's cool. Speaking of the mouth. Um, I just recently uh, bought for the first time the designs for health periobiotic toothpaste. Oh, yeah. I really like it. It's it is weird not rinsing your mouth afterwards. Yes. Um, but I, I love it. And I'm a big fan. I know Charles always taught about, you know, oral microbiome, and you can increase your total body strength. This just I thought that was cool. Um, you know, you mentioned a gram, you say a gram to a gram and a half, right? Per pound of body weight. 
Mm -hmm. I, okay. I, I start with a gram. I know that increasing protein is difficult. Um, yeah. Protein requires a lot of digestive juices, but if you're an athlete or someone who's looking to put muscle mass on, or you're in sort of, I'm right now in a hypertrophy stage of my training, um, protein is that building block, but yeah. I think we need to look beyond protein as just being that building block of muscle. We sort of know that protein is necessary for detoxification, proper detoxification. We all drink our green juices and we think we're doing good for our liver, but without sufficient amino acid intake, your liver is going to shut down in 48 hours. So yeah. it's actually good quality proteins. That's going to help you detox, not, not your green drink. So don't be miserable. You can eat protein. Um, and, and of course, um, neurotransmitter production. So yeah. Charles was a fan of the meat and nut breakfast because it increased your dopamine. And, um, I don't care who you are. You want more dopamine, you right. want motivation and you want drive. Um, a lot of the social media and constantly checking our email and our phone that depletes our dopamine. And it leaves us demotivated, not having the energy or the drive to do much of anything. So, right. um, meat and nuts can do that. But I mean, it, again, it could also come from like a good quality beef protein shake or, um, you know, something that is palatable to you in the morning that contains sufficient amino acids, good quality fats. Yeah. You, you touched on neurotransmitters with the meat and nuts. And I wanted you to, to talk a little bit more about that. Can you talk, and it's the, the taurine, right? In the red meat and, and the, the choline and the nuts, like yeah. talk a little bit more about that, please. Cause people might hear the word neurotransmitter, but just tell them why they need it more and, and why, you know, if you can, you should down a steak at breakfast and, you know, at, like, you know, grab a handful of cashews or mixed nuts or whatever. Yeah, taurine is a key player, uh, a key player when it comes to, you know, producing more dopamine. And um, we've got a ton of, uh, glutamine is the most in the blood, um, but we've got a ton of amino acids, good quality amino acids coming in from steak. And then of course, um, if you're eating something with connective tissue, so, you know, yeah. eat, eat the weird bit, eat the the skin and the, and the nerve endings and all of that, right. because um, especially in a basketball type situation, when joint health and connective tissue health is so important. Yeah. You're usually going to be a very, I'm five feet tall. So you're a very tall individual where joints are getting constant pressure put on them. We want to support collagen production to help oh, with yeah. that. But on the neurotransmitter side of things, I mean, we have several, so dopamine is our drive, our motivation. It's going to be our, you know, get ish done neurotransmitter. So that's going to be fantastic. And uh, a, a practice or a game type situation when you want to, you know, perform your best. But we also really want to focus on something like serotonin. Um, serotonin, when it comes to sleep, is, is very important along with melatonin. Well, that's predominantly made in our gut. So we want to make sure we take care of our gut health by eliminating inflammatory foods and eating good collagen producing foods to help to support our gut lining. Uh, there's another neurotransmitter, acetylcholine, uh, we want, I mean, realistically, we want to, we're going to be dominant in one or two of these neurotransmitters, but we want to be producing them in adequate amounts. Acetylcholine is our focus, yeah. our memory and focus um, in a sport where obviously it's going to be very important for you to focus and understand what's going on, i.e. any sport. Um, you want that. Now, choline, uh, you, you made mention coming from eggs, it's animal products where we get these amino acids in the available form that we need them in. Yeah. So beyond just getting in your protein, um, I really emphasize getting it from good quality animal sources. Um, by no means am I saying, you know, that there isn't merit for plants, but I think what we're seeing more and more as an athlete is that, um, you know, it, being an omnivore, being someone who consumes animal products is very important. If you are plant-based, work with a coach to understand how to not be deficient because you 100% will be. You yeah. can't get what you need from, right. from plants. So when we're talking about these neurotransmitters, we're talking about animal foods. So let's go into the actual, so we, we've covered a lot of the groundwork of energy and how it's created and why we need to do certain things to have more energy. Um, now we know, let's talk about basketball because um, that's the sport that I love. It's the sport that I'm really trying to help uh, the athletes become better. And we know that a healthier athlete is a better performing athlete. It's a faster, more recovering, a faster, more recovering athlete, whatever. Um, so um, so I, I really focus on the health side of things. And I'm so glad you, you've said everything that you've said. The energy systems that we know 
are, are mostly using the game of basketball. So we have, I'm just going to go real quick. You know, we have the ATP PC system. Um, we have the glycolytic system. We have the aerobic system for, for lack of easy terminology talking with people. I just call them the energy systems one, two, and three. Mm -hmm. Right. So that first energy system, the ATP PC, uh, we use 60% of the time in basketball. And what I tell people is, you know, basketball is played between zero and five meters. Like, you know, you, you try to beat someone off, you know, try to beat the defender. Um, you try to, you, you know, you jump as high and hard as you can for a dunk, for a rebound, for a block. Um, mm -hmm. If it's a fast break, you're sprinting, you know, up the court. Um, you know, defense is played really, really quick in, in just a couple steps here, a couple steps there. Uh, everything's done really fast, right? So we have ATP PC, and then we have the glycolytic system, which is 20%. And that makes up 80% of the effort that you do on the basketball court. And then there's that last one, the aerobic, you know, whatever you want to call it, oxidative, blah, 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 uh, is other, the last 20%. Um, so what I like to do is focus on the, that first 80% of the game. And so how can we improve that energy source so that you have quick, strong legs in the fourth quarter so that when you want to explode up for a rebound, that energy is there. Um, and, and the reason, let me just go a little bit more, Melissa, before I you know, let you speak. The energy systems all use different fuel sources, which is why it's important when we train with basketball to train in those first two energy systems, mm -hmm. because that makes our bodies more efficient at delivering the fuel sources that those energy systems need. And I just did a talk on it on Facebook last week about, you know, stop jogging, stop running long distance is yeah. when you're trying to get stamina or endurance for the game of basketball because you're training your body to be more efficient at a other different fuel source that isn't the predominant ones of basketball and you're actually going to make yourself slower um, Preston Green talks a lot about that a lot um, and so how can basketball players really improve their energy production during a game during practices in those first two primary energy systems yeah, I mean, you, you um, touch on a lot of really good points. And when you think of the substrate, so what do those energy systems use to produce that fuel? You know, it, it is predominantly, so in the first energy system, obviously creatine. Um, right. So if we talk about that from a nutritional standpoint, uh, red meat is a fantastic way to up your creatine. But of course, creatine supplementation is necessary because you, you just said it, it's one of those like short bursts, um, right. but then it's gone. And, um, and then of course, in the glycolytic environment, well, we, we are going to be kind of running on that really readily available fuel, which is sugars. Um, now everything really comes down to quality when we're talking about that in the sport of basketball, you know, like you said, uh, what we're not going to be here in an endurance race, jogging at a slow pace. We, we're not really, I mean, could you run on fuel at, on, on fat as fuel? Absolutely. Fat is a slow burner. Yeah. So if you're an athlete that's looking to get fast bursts of energy, you want to make sure that your glycogen stores are nice and full and that your creatine phosphate system can readily turn over so that when you use that, um, then you can rest and then be ready and recharged to, again, you know, be, be in the game in another aspect again, but it's again, a short explosive burst of energy. So from a nutrition standpoint, making sure that we're getting enough adequate creatine coming from red meat, but then of course, supplementing uh, yeah. with a powder because of how incredibly safe it is. Um, I think that that's a really good way uh, to do that. And then just not being afraid of carbohydrate, but choosing and selecting the right carbohydrate for the sport that you're in. So, you know, maybe that's looking like some good quality like berries, cherries, and fruits, um, because we know there's a ton of antioxidants and fiber that are coming in there. Um, we're using a carb powder to support our energy levels during exercise. Um, I really love, you know, beyond even that too, just making sure that we're hydrated and you do not hydrate with water. You hydrate with electrolytes. I, I mean, again, I was a paramedic. If I had a, a patient who needed to be hydrated, so I needed to give them an IV, and I gave them an IV of water, I would kill them. Yeah. Your, your blood is 90% sodium. So, you know, with our hydration complex that, you know, speaking of, of Preston and a lot of our other basketball coaches and athletes, they're using hydration complex because you've got your salts in there, you've got your electrolytes. And then we actually use, um, it's similar to carbohydrate, but deribose, which helps with energy mm -hmm. production. Um, again, kind of going back to the mitochondria, the mitochondria use deribose, um, and it's a great energy source for them. So I, from a nutritional standpoint, I would go there. And then I would also make sure that for those athletes, 
they are supplementing a, a multivitamin that supports mitochondria. So specifically the Krebs cycle, and I'm not going to get into grade nine science and pull up the, the, mito, the Krebs cycle, but you know, there, there is this sort of circle, if you will, that, that spins and there are cofactors to make that circle spin. And you want that circle to spin if you're an athlete who needs quick energy and um, so, you know, specific B vitamins. So uh, one, two, three, five, six, we want them in high levels. We want coenzyme Q10. We want things like carnosine. Um, again, not to kind of, I'm a big fan of animal proteins, not to go back to that red meat scenario, but guess what? You get all of those from good quality grass-fed animal products. You mentioned sodium and I mean, you mentioned so many things I want to touch on. I have two <laughs> fingers up because I at least want to touch on two things. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Sodium is one of those things where it's, it's vilified, you know, but, yeah. um, you know, Chris Kresser, who's a, you know, global health, you know, coach guru kind of guy, um, you know, he says it's impossible to oversalt your food, assuming you're using, you know, proper food and using proper salt. Right. Um, and, and can you just, for the record, just tell people like, as long as you're using good salt, you should be salting your food. Because I have so many parents, oh, don't eat, don't, quit salting. It's too salty. It's like, well, everyone says like, oh, I ate something really salty. So I feel bloated and I feel crummy. And then I typically ask like, well, what is it that you ate? And oftentimes what I'm hearing is like, oh, potato chips. Oh, French yeah. fries. Oh, um, sushi. And when I break it down with the client, I'm like, okay, wait a minute. Yes, there was sodium in that meal. But guess what else was there? In a French fry, it was deep fried and hydrogenated oils, which are trans fats, inflammatory in the body. And he had a crap ton of carbohydrate coming in there. So yeah. um, James Nicola Antonio, he's a PhD, I believe out of Buffalo wrote the book, the salt fix. And he says, you know, don't blame salt for what carbohydrates have done. If you're using table, table salt. So, so iodized table salt, yeah. you're actually getting 50% sodium, 50% glucose. So wow. sugar is attached to that table salt. Um, if you're supplementing with, I love Redmond sea salt, um, just as one particular brand, but Himalayan yep. gray salt, Celtic salt, whatever you want, a natural salt, uh, you do not have to be worried about, yeah. um, high blood pressure, um, you know, or, or any negative health consequences attached to sodium. I love Wolfgang Unsold in Germany. And he has, you know, all of his clients start the day with, a, either lime or lemon, uh, fully squeezed into water with some salt. And I know myself, I mean, I am a salt fiend, uh, but we know that salt stimulates the adrenals and I have two little ones. And last night I was up between from four to five, helping the one throughout the night. So, you know, I, you know, when I wake up, you know, whatever I'm eating, I, I tend to throw a lot of salt on it, but we know that that helps to stimulate your adrenals. And if you're craving salt, your batteries are probably low and your body's like, you know, give me salt. Um, but yeah, your salt should have color. Make sure you're salt in your food and your body will, will regulate that for you. It'll say, you know, we're good over here with the salt or, Hey, we need a little more, but man, what a great point you made that it's, it's not the salt that's causing most people's problems or, or, you know, reasons for feeling crummy. It's the other crap that they're throwing in their body. Wow. How cool. Um, the other thing I want to touch on, if we could back up. So let's say, uh, let, let's say um, a basketball player has games on back-to-back -back days, or they have a, a game and then a practice the next morning, which we often did. Um, you mentioned glycogen and glycogen is essentially glucose stored in the muscles, right? And it's yeah. predominantly like right there for your energy source. Um, and it's a quick serving energy. Um, and we know that glycogen is more of a 24 hour recovery type thing, right? Like, so if we have a game and we want to be good for our practice the next day or game the next day, we need to, uh, because of all that glycogen that we just depleted in the game, we need to recover it right away and start replenishing it. What would a good plate, uh, what would a good meal post game to recover glycogen look like for a basketball player so that the next day they can still perform and have energy? Yeah, I, I would absolutely start with a post uh, game or post training uh, shake that included a carbohydrate powder that was fast. Okay. Uh, so firstly, I would want to start with that, especially if you're a lean individual who doesn't have a body composition goal, uh, let's get in those readily available carbs. Um, but then absolutely, we're going to want to add in some carbohydrate that are more complex at that point. So um, I'm a big fan of doing uh, carbohydrates that are as uh, low on the inflammatory scale as possible. I deal with a lot of people who have autoimmune type conditions. Um, so I'm not a huge fan of gluten and grains. Um, yeah. I think, you know, despite some people who feel 
feel they can tolerate them well as a carbohydrate source. They're typically not tolerating them very well. Um, so I, I go for things like uh, fruit, sweet potatoes, uh, white rice, white yeah. rice. Um, you know, again, there's a phytic acid uh, that is contained in, in rice and it's a lot easier to digest white rice. Um, if you're really concerned about the insulin spike, you know, eat it cold, um, make it ahead of time and eat it at room temperature. Yeah. Isn't there more lectins too in brown rice? There is, there absolutely yeah. is. I mean, uh, that, that brown rice, the, it's like a jacket of protection for the rice so that yeah. if an animal or an insect ate it, they would feel uncomfortable. Well, that is, uh, is minimized in the human because obviously we're a lot larger than a bug. But if this is something that we're eating on a regular basis and clients love hearing this because they're like, wait a minute, yeah. I don't need to eat because brown rice tastes like cardboard. So right. yeah, white rice, um, good quality uh, root vegetables. I'm a big fan of, uh, of root vegetables. If you can tolerate them well, they're great for autoimmune. Um, and then there's a wide variety of fruits as well that you can include on a plate with a, a good quality a piece of protein from an animal. And um, of course, adding in some vegetable there. You mentioned cooling your rice, which if I'm not mistaken, the same thing happens when you cool potatoes. Can you yeah, tell people why? Start. Yeah. Can you tell people why that, why they should do that and why it could be good for them? Yeah, for sure. So, I mean, anytime you eat a food, for the most part, unless it's like a pure fat, you're going to get an insulin spike, right? So um, if you're talking from a fat loss situation, we don't want an insulin spike because that's a fat storage hormone. Um, there could be benefits though to, especially in the post-workout window, we do actually want to spike insulin and then we want it to come down fairly soon after. Um, as an athlete, we want to keep energy levels uh, really, uh, really nice and even in kilter. So we, we don't want these crazy up and downs of our insulin and our blood glucose. So um, if you have a, a very high glycemic or a, a carbohydrate that has a high insulinogenic response and insulin shoots up, uh, you're not a very good thing. So if we cool our carbohydrates, you cook your potatoes ahead of time, pop it in the fridge, you increase the amount of the re resistant starch in that vegetable. Um, so you get less of a response from, from insulin and a resistant starch is just something that's not going to affect the blood sugar levels as much as a, a typical carbohydrate. And people need to think fiber, right? When they think, when they yeah. hear that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's so cool. That's awesome. Um, okay. So we, we covered like post game, you know, again, it's probably late at night between eight and midnight, you know, but they, they, they got to refuel, they got to replenish their glycogen. So you said a really good animal protein source and, and, and you tend to side with about 30 grams is about all the human body can digest at a time. Or would you do more? I know Charles I mean, loves to go up to gazillion amounts of grams of protein. Yeah, what, what do you say? bigger bodybuilders and athletes yeah. that are larger, obviously that would go larger, you know, that's a baseline and, and that's right. really a minimum amount. So I would say, you yeah. know, if you're looking at the average basketball player, who's like 200 plus pounds, um, you know, 30 yeah. grams of protein is not sufficient. Right. Um, so I, I would definitely go according to your body weight at that point. And at least it's simple math, you know, at least start with a gram. Um, right. but if, if sustaining muscle mass or perhaps maintaining or increasing it is what your priority is, you would be better off going higher. I like going higher myself just because of uh, the kind of, you know, leaky gut, you know, kind of stuff I've always been dealing with. And I just want to be able to absorb the amount. So I go over just so I can maybe get it. I know the, the, the high school gals, I was connected with a, um, uh, an AAU club in Austin where I trained a lot of their, their, you know, middle school and high school athletes. And gosh, some of those girls would only eat 20 or 30 grams in an entire day. So this is it's a like, big issue for me. Like I think as female <laughs> athletes and as women, and I, I mean, I don't want to go too far aside here, but there's also like the social aspect of eating protein. And like, I'd be out with friends, let's say, you know, co-ed male and female friends. And when I'm ordering the steak, the server is bringing the steak to my male counterpart. And I'm like, no, 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 no. It's, it's yeah. over here. So, you know, as, as female athletes, we need to understand that we, we need protein too. And to not be afraid, it, it is not going to make you big and bulky. And no. uh, per, for the most part, women, female athletes are under eating protein severely. Severely. Even, even the, the, again, I had, I'm thinking of one athlete I trained, she was probably five foot four, 115 pounds. But when you look at her, you know, an hour on the, uh, an hour with skills, an hour and a half on basketball practice. And then she trains with me for an hour. Like she mm -hmm. needs upwards of 3000 calories, maybe more in a day. Mm -hmm. And she's eating 800, 900. And you know, every, the, the number one response, whenever these kids come in to train with me, Hey, how do you feel today? The number one response is tired. 
they tired. always say tired nine out of 10 times. It's like, gosh, parents feed your kids, especially those girls who are, like you said, there's such a, I hate to say it. There's this social thing. Uh, we can't eat a lot. Like, no, you got to fuel up. You got to have energy. Okay. So post game, you got that covered. They go to sleep. We've talked about the morning meat and nuts breakfast. You know, if you can, you know, I like to tell people breakfast foods is just a marketing ploy. Like forget the concept of breakfast food. Um, eat meat, eat nuts, eat, you know, seeds, raw nuts and seeds, things like that. Um, and then that midday, maybe pregame meal, you know, hour, two hours, three hours, hopefully not an hour before, but two, three hours before a game. Is that what you recommend? And what should be on that plate for energy production? Yeah. So at that point I would probably, so a meat and nut breakfast is usually a higher uh, fat. So yeah. you're going to have maybe a cut of steak, like a ribeye that has a higher fat percentage. Um, and then obviously your nuts and seeds contain fat as a pregame, I would actually kind of go the other way where now, so the way that I can like look at the three macronutrients, proteins, fats, and carbohydrate is sort of envision a scale. Um, protein is the center of the scale. So it is always there and it is never changing. You want that yep. protein to be consistent. And then depending on the meal, we can manipulate those other two macronutrients, the, the fats and the carbohydrate accordingly. So if, if fats are higher, carbohydrates inversely should come down. Um, yep. So there's your meat and nut. And then as a pregame, I would actually go in the other direction. This is where I'm going to want to introduce some carbohydrate. Oh, again, like you said, hopefully it's not like 30 minutes before. So it's right. sitting in your stomach. Right. Um, have some carbohydrate. I would choose a leaner protein at this point a okay. protein that's perhaps easier to digest like uh, poultry or like a white fish yeah. and a carbohydrate again to be able to easily digest that's not going to be overly heavy not not too too much fiber in that right. pre-game meal yeah and that's the first time we mentioned carbs or, or mentioned macronutrients uh, in general in terms of all three of them and and you know the way i just like to explain it to people is pretty much exactly what you said protein's constant and then fat and carbs need to be viewed as energy Right. right. It's just a, yeah. So uh, I, I like what you said. So we, we, ref, we replenish glycogen on our post game. We wake up, we have meat and nuts breakfast, we get our fats and then our pregame, we should have more carbs, less fat, right? Because fat is going to be longer to digest, right? It's going to kind of sit there a little bit longer. Yeah. It carbs slows everything us, else down really. Right. And remember those energy systems that we're using in the basketball game, the, the carbs will actually give us, give us more fuel. Now um, let's go into, we're, we're leading up to game time. And this is, I think where I'm really excited to hear what you have to say um, because I want to talk supplementation. Cause I know people still are always looking for that competitive edge and it, you know, I've always loved, and, and I, I'm pretty sure you have too, but correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but especially with Charles, like people, uh, well, we love the, we, we love the, the nootropics. We love the brain supplements, yeah. we, we, the alpha GPCs, the PC, all that type of stuff. Like, can you talk about maybe, um, and feel free to share your screen if you want. Can you talk about what are some good supplements to maybe that help us give us a competitive edge, um, pregame, pre-practice, you know, over our, over our competition? Yeah, absolutely. I can, uh, I can also pull up, but what I'll start talking about first is what you just mentioned, which is the nootropic side of things, which again, increasingly popular smart drugs. Sometimes yeah. they're affectionately called, obviously they're not drugs, right. uh, but they act on the brain. And um, essentially this is just a classification of nutrient that's going to those neurotransmitters that we talked about before, that's going to support certain neurotransmitters. So let's talk about some of the neurotransmitters that we would want in a game. So absolutely, okay. we're going to want some focus. We're going to want memory. So a GPC liquid uh, essentially is a product that is a glycerol phosphocholine. So it crosses the blood brain barrier. We want this because a lot of what we do in natural health, it usually takes, you know, four to six weeks to work. We're not pharmaceutical. We're, we're the long game. It's right. more sustainable that way. But What's really great about GPC liquid is um, you feel it and you feel it quickly. You, typically, I would take this, you know, 20 minutes before you're about to start a lift. Um, definitely use it when you are focusing on your big Olympic lifts, when you've got a rep range of like one to four and you yeah. really need to be laser focused in that movement. We're pushing big weight. Um, GPC is what you want. It goes into the brain. It increases acetylcholine. So acetylcholine, that, that focus, um, and we're able to get, you know, more, more of that out of our brain. 
that's a really nice fast acting. And yeah. then another uh, supplement that I like using or nutrient that I like using um, is our pre-workout complex. Um, and again, all of this information, I, I can send you some details to put in the show notes to, right. to link to the website. Um, but this focuses on your neurotransmitters like your dopamine um, that are more specific to that motivation and drive. So, um, and of course, some, some acetyl L-carnitine. So we're really, we're looking at a cognitive energy here. I think the, the biggest misconception with a pre-workout powder is that uh, we, we immediately think caffeine. Yeah. Um, so let's just take a ton of caffeine. Um, and, and, and a cup of coffee before a workout is a great pre-workout, but oh, yeah. uh, if we want to energize more appropriately, let's start looking at how to energize the, the brain. Yeah. Um, anytime that somebody has, like, if you've done a marathon and you've experienced that bonk, um, you know, everyone always thinks that, oh, it's, I don't have enough sugar going to my muscles or energy going to my muscles. So my body doesn't move. No, it, it's actually your brain. Yeah. Um, so let's really energize and fuel your brain. And, and that pre-workout powder really has a lot of um, nutrients specific to, to dopamine and drive. You mentioned the blood brain barrier. Can you just uh, talk about, you know, as long as you want or as little as you want, what is that and, and, and why you kind of touched on it, but why do we want products that cross it? And, 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 you know, maybe that acetyl, you know, word we need to look for, but what doesn't cross it, what does cross it? And, and again, you touched on it, but maybe go a little deeper as to why. Yeah, absolutely. So we're, we're fat heads. Um, your brain is 60% fat. So if someone gives you that insult, you can say, yes, absolutely. Um, so there's a lot to, to know there. We've got a membrane that protects, you know, our, every cell in our body. Um, and then also of course, protecting our brain and, um, certain nutrients that are fat soluble or small enough to cross that fat barrier are able to act on the brain. So I'll just give some specific examples. Anything like you said, that has that acetyl group as a prefix. So the word prior, so acetyl L-carnitine is carnitine that's going to make it to your brain. Speaking yeah. of mitochondria, again, tons of mitochondria in the brain, carnitine is going to be an energy source for you and will act on the brain. The uh, glycerol phosphocholine has that acetyl group there where again, it's able to cross. Um, it's a less, less of a large molecule. It's a smaller molecule, which is able to cross. Whereas phosphatidylcholine um, is big and normally acts on the liver. Uh, so there's an example there. And then um, a product that I really love when it comes to sleep is using magnesium three and eight. So if you're using magnesium to help you sleep and you're using magnesium glycinate or magnesium malate, these are massive molecules that do not fit yeah. through the small uh, little barrier of the brain. So what you're actually looking for is a, a mag three and eight, uh, the threonic acid that it's attached to is really, really small, awesome research out of MIT. Uh, and that's able to cross the blood brain barrier. So if you've not taken a product like this, you've never had magnesium go to your brain. You just had it go to your skeletal muscle and that's, that's good but um, get some magnesium to your yeah. brain and oh, what an amazing way to get uh, GABA levels up and, you know, help to support those neurotransmitters there and nice and calm. I remember when I first started taking some alpha GPC and some acetyl L-carnitine and typically large doses, um, Wolfgang will go up to six grams. I did that a few yes. times of uh, Alcar, but I usually was around four grams and then I'd pop a couple GPC as well. And yeah, your workouts go to a different level. I feel like it's, there's definitely a, uh, a zing, you know, in your brain that you're like, okay, Rocket I'm ready. Fuel. I'm ready to go. Yeah. 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 What are some other energy producing supplements that, that, that you uh, recommend and promote a lot? Yeah. Um, something that I use as sort of like my multivitamin and full disclosure, I'm actually not a fan of a multi. Uh, yeah. so yeah, I, I kind of say that and people are like, what? And so when I look at a multivitamin, um, you know, for me, it's really important to take the therapeutic dose of the nutrients that are specific to what I need. Um, yeah. So, you know, I take a standalone vitamin D, I take a standalone magnesium. However, um, our Mito Energy Complex is uh, a product that I actually use as a multivitamin. Um, so this is like a mitochondrial support. Uh, going back to the Krebs cycle there, this is just a, a vitamin that we've created that has all of those cofactors. So everything that um, your, your Krebs cycle needs to spin. And um, what's really cool is it's kind of all in that capsule. So you're getting your B vitamins, you're getting a little bit of creatine in there. Um, when it comes to supporting energy, 
this is what I use for the long game. So no, I don't feel it immediately when I take it. It's the fact that I'm supporting my mitochondria and I'm doing sort of that undercover work where I can perform better overall by doing that bare, that foundation. Yeah. Wow. That's really cool. So before games, you'd recommend, um, and if you want to give dosages, you can, if you don't want to, that's fine too. But, um, you recommend an athlete might take some acetyl L carnitine, some alpha GPC. Um, there was a third one you mentioned, what was the third one, but, um, how much should we take of these? And, and, and are there people that are contraindications, people who maybe shouldn't take them? Yeah, really good question. And so for the most part, um, with the designs for sport line, we've dosed our products according to support the needs of an athlete. Now, um, typically that's your average 150 pound person. So again, we need to be realistic. A lot of my answers are kind of like, it depends because yeah. let's look at the person that's in front of us. So right. what I would say is that, um, you know, following the, with the pre-train, with the um, pre-workout complex, which is the powder that has the acetyl L carnitine, all the dopamine factors, um, that's in a scooper. So you would go according to sort of your body size there, barring in mind that the serving size is for 150 pounds. Uh, for the GPC, majority of the studies that show these phenomenal effects of GPC, so increasing growth hormone, increasing acetylcholine, um, it's typically 1200 milligrams. Okay. So again, this is just based on the literature and, and, and you can dose accordingly that way. So those would be my two as a pre, uh, intra creatine and uh, free form amino acids. So essential amino acids, 100% kick the, the sports drink that is full of like artificial flavors and colors and get yeah. yourself a good amino acid. Um, and then I would say sort of post-workout, probably a bit more creatine, get your carbs in, get your protein in, um, and then sort of offline or um, outside of games, making sure that you get that mitochondrial support uh, as your multivitamin to cover your bases. So you mentioned the literature dosage. But then we can talk Charles dosage, as I like to <laughs> well, as I like to refer to it. Yeah. Um, what are what are the limits, maybe, of some of those things that you've done or you've seen people do? And now, granted, you know you're a different size than you know even you know Rob Jacobs or even myself or other coaches you've worked with. But um, you know, I'm curious personally. Maybe you don't have to give names, but what are some things that you've seen out there? <laughs> Just gonna throw some people under the bus. Here. Yeah. Here, here's the, here's the cool stuff about this research is that, um, the research population that they were studying when they did 1200 milligrams were, um, patients that had had stroke. This was actually done okay. in, um, Italy patients that had functionally had suffered from strokes. So this was a very high dose in a very serious situation. Yeah. Um, so yes, I mean, the way that I described Charles, um, who there was, there's no one like Charles and there will never be is right. if, if some is good, then more is better. Uh, yeah. And then Charles's dose is best. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I would be cautious. I would be cautious. Um, especially if you have you know, do a brave room and test, get a neurotransmitter profile test done to find out what's going on because we don't want to go overkill here. Um, two full droppers, uh, and then you can actually do that twice a day to get your 1200 milligrams. It really will suffice. And, and I would say majority of the coaches I work with are sticking to that dose because right. they're getting what they need from it. That's awesome. So we're talking supplements. We've talked sunlight. And, um, you know, while you were talking, I kind of got to thinking that, you know, going back upstream again, you know, we're, we're pretty downstream now, pregame, you know, nootropic type stuff. Um, the importance of vitamin D and if someone doesn't have the levels and granted nowadays, especially, so the NBA draft was last night and these kids, they're being, they're, they're born in 2000 and 2001 and two, I'm like, holy cow, what I am getting old here. But some, you know, these are kids that, you know, even if they know they should be in the sun, they probably don't care and they'll just stay inside on their phones and whatnot. But the importance of vitamin D and if you don't get the sunlight or if you live, like we mentioned earlier in the in far North, far South, like how much do we need and, and, and do we need to supplement and, you know, do we need to supplement in the summer versus the winter? And can you touch about vitamin D? Cause I think if there's one nutrient that, that people need is gotta be vitamin D. Vitamin D is kind of what I call one of my like non-negotiables. Yeah. Um, it's a fat soluble vitamin. So that's also very important to remember that just getting a good quality vitamin D one that also comes with K2 um, is going to be incredibly important. Um, 
so we know that athletes that are deficient in vitamin D, they have signs of impaired muscle function. Um, this is also going to impair repair recovery. It's going to decrease immunity. Um, you, we also see suboptimal. So this isn't even just a uh, low, but suboptimal, uh, levels of vitamin D increasing injury, stress fracture, um, suboptimal performance. So this will interfere with your performance. Um, yeah. like you mentioned, you know, sensible sun is exposure is what we're looking for. So if you're not getting at least 30 minutes, um, between sort of like that noon hour is kind of what we're hoping for. Uh, supplementation is, necessary. Uh, food alone is not enough to, to get your vitamin D. You might get like small, small amounts from eggs, uh, a tiny bit, I think from mushrooms, but realistically, uh, not, uh, right. so for an athlete, I think it's absolutely necessary to give a dose would be hard again, just according to how deficient you are. Um, uh, but starting with a good quality vitamin D that contains vitamin K2 and then getting outside, I think is a really good start. Um, and, and let's just think about this as your absolute foundation of health, but yeah. very much linked to performance, testosterone production, mood. Well, and you've, and you can touch on it more if you want, but I've seen, I mean, vitamin D with the receptor being on every cell in our body, it affects literally everything that we do from immune system to digestion, to brain function, to muscle repair and growth to everything. Like, and as an athlete, Gosh, if you want your if you want the the leg up on your competition, you really need to optimize your vitamin D levels because there's a lot of athletes out there that that don't have them optimized and are still performing at a high level. And it's gosh, if you just got your sleep and had a higher vitamin D level, like man, you could you know there's I think there's so many injuries that could be prevented. And again, that goes back to training as well. But like you said, if you don't get enough sleep, your pain tolerance goes down, which means you or goes up, which means you can get injured easier. Obviously, vitamin D is really important for a host of functions throughout, you know, the, the, the nervous system, the ligamentous system, the skeletal Bone muscle health. system. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, so I've seen a few different ranges. What, what do you like to see range wise on lab work if people do have labs? We, uh, we use a different system here in Canada. I figured, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I don't, we, I personally don't, don't work with labs. I typically work okay. in conjunction with the doctor. So I, yeah. that's what I would say yeah. is that, you know, work with a functional medicine practitioner or um, a practitioner who can run labs and look at that number because right. to your point, even supplementing, I mean, this is anecdotal, but I think worth mentioning is that I was supplementing at 10,000 IU. And again, I'm not recommending um, right. This is my personal experience. I was, rec I was supplementing with 10,000 IU and I was doing that in a, ca in a tablet form. So it was actually just like a hard pill. This is obviously prior to knowing what I know now. Um, my levels didn't budge. Right. Um, I switched over to a liquid vitamin D. Um, I still stuck to the same range actually in the 10,000. And I was doing that daily, but this time it had K1, K2 and it was liquid. Um, and my vitamin D levels actually shot up to, you know, well above average being within that normal range. And that didn't take um, really any more time than I think it was four weeks. So, uh, you know, something that I recommend and I refer out, please work with somebody who can right. show you that level and can bring you up properly to that level. And, and again, we're not looking at baseline. We're looking at optimal as right. an athlete. I don't think anyone on this call wants to be um, average. If we're looking to get somewhere, we're, we're looking to be optimal and to those genetic freaks out there, uh, you know, you can get that little extra edge on your performance by doing some of these, these foundational things. Yeah. Wow. That's awesome. Yeah. Really good points. Uh, I'm really smart. Is there anything else you want to add about energy production? Anything that we might have missed or anything you want to cover? Um, well, something that I actually was thinking about before the call, and I think it's really worth making mention to, there's a lot of talk that, you know, on adrenal fatigue, and, and this was like this very popularized concept. And I think what's important now and what we know now, and I'm glad we spent the time talking about mitochondria is it really is necessary to go a little bit deeper. Um, and, and there's a really cool quote that um, for me, you know, stress and supporting stress, obviously there's a bit of a personal connection there too, but with my athletes and my executive clients, I see this, the adrenal glands, they're responsible for regulating a wide variety of processes in the body. Um, and then obviously I think we all know the fight or flight response due to stressful situations. So hormones are pumped out, neurotransmitters are used, um, you know, we're trying to obviously regulate energy levels on an ongoing basis. Um, and 
when we, what we really want to make the connection between is that when we are practicing hard during game day, depriving our body of sleep, we are, are sort of putting our body into that fight or flight state, just the same way that we think of stress or adrenal fatigue. So yeah. I think for any of the athletes on the call, if there's one thing to take away when it comes to energy production is just really remembering that, um, our body recognizes stress is unfortunately the exact same thing, uh, whether it's uh, sleep deprivation, a really tough game, or getting to an, a fight with our, our loved ones. So uh, stress is stress is stress. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and gosh, I, I, so the HPA axis dysregulation is really what we're looking at, right? It's not just that adrenal fatigue part. There's other parts of the whole, you know, we mentioned the other day, Krebs, or earlier Krebs cycle. I, you know, situations like this, I like to kind of refer to the recycle logo with the arrow pointing to the yes. arrow pointing to the arrow. Like, yeah, it's not just this one thing over here. There's other things that are affecting and we're just causing this dysregulation all over. Um, and, and everything you mentioned can really help to support this dysregulation and improve energy. Yeah. Um, cool. Anything else you want to add? I mean, this was great. I think there's a lot of huge takeaways and yeah. I really appreciate just having an opportunity to talk about some of these topics that, um, you know, with designs for sport, our motto is better science, better sport. And, um, I love that there are people like yourself that are really dispelling some of the bro science that's out there and talking about the real science so that athletes can get the most out of their, their day to day. I tell people with anything, you get what you pay for. And so many you know people down here that I've worked with, they go to Costco and they get the you know, the nature made brand, you know, thousand capsules for nine 99. I'm like, well, you get what you pay for. So, um, you know, designs for sport is, and designs for health. They're just phenomenal quality. I, I think you guys do awesome work and there's so much research put behind it and the, you know, you, you, you're going to pay more, but you're going to get more in return for sure. Yeah. I like to say like the most expensive supplement is the one that isn't working for you. So yeah. if those Costco fish oils are, you know, coming in 300 caps and you're burping them up, well, you're, you're not what you take, you're what you absorb. Yep. Yep. How can folks uh, find you? How can folks get a hold of you? Yeah, absolutely. So um, if you're a coach or an athlete, you can connect with me, you know, either via email or um, via Instagram. So I'm uh, make shifts happen um, underscores. I'll send over my information in the show notes. Um, yep. You can also follow designs for sport on Instagram, tons of content um, yeah. and education and resources for coaches. And that's just at designs for sport on Instagram and on Facebook. And the designs for sport line is um, you know, NFH certified and or NFS certified and, and, yes. and, you know, GMP good practices. And maybe do you want to talk for a second on that actually, since I, we brought it up, like why, why is designs for sport better than other supplements? Yeah. So, I mean, NSF um, and NSF sport doesn't always mean even quality. Um, right. NSF sport, obviously, from a pro athlete perspective, covers you um, against 270 banned substances. It makes yeah. sure that, of course, if you compete at a high level, um, that you can use these products safely because they are absolutely free of banned substances. What makes designs for sport different is that um, instead of just going down that one NSF sport route, we've also made sure that these are the highest level of professionally quality professional quality products. So you're not going to find um, any, you know, gluten fillers, sugar, artificial sweeteners and colors. Um, you're getting an incredibly high quality professional level product that's also safe to use um, from a pro athlete perspective. Yeah. We also do, um, we're exclusive to strength coaches and trainers. Um, and of course, we also have our education side, which is a huge piece of what we do, um, which is really just helping to evolve trainers and coaches to give them the tools that they need. That's awesome. And I think the education piece is so huge. And um, I, we didn't even talk about it, but athletes are so, uh, they want the edge and they take all these supplements that have the artificial stuff in it, which, you know, Design Sports Sport won't have any of that, which is so much better for you. Again, you're going to pay more, but your body will benefit. I love that. Cool. Oh, yeah. Well, thanks, for, Melissa, for being here. I really appreciate it. And um, we will talk to you very soon. Make shifts happen is how you find Melissa on Instagram. Uh, check out the Designs for Sport on Instagram or their website. I'm assuming it's designsforsport.com. Designsforsport.com, you got it.